Good afternoon, I'm Robin Sternick. Welcome to another one of our Spotlight Seminars. Since we believe that knowledge is power, over the past several years, we have enjoyed bringing info sessions like today to our clients and friends. Today, we are going to learn more about intentional philanthropy. Martin Luther King once said, there is never a wrong time to do the right thing. You joining us today evidences your passion around giving back. As a former member of the Greater Kansas City Community Foundation Board and fund holder at the Jewish Community Foundation of Greater Kansas City, I have seen firsthand the power of aligning donors and their passions. KC is fortunate to have many avenues of giving and a very generous spirit. As members of the current and next generation of philanthropists in KC and beyond, you and your family members before you are in that group and you continue to make a difference. For many of our clients, a tailored giving plan is an important piece of their overall financial plan. To help us drive impact even further, today we have joined forces with Allison Patterson of Patterson Philanthropic Advisors, who will provide us with ways to focus on and strategically design a dynamic giving plan. Austin Drake, a senior wealth advisor here at Sterna Capital, will also provide us with some up-to-date thinking on optimizing the tactics of giving through a tax-sensitive lens. As we all navigate through our financial lives, I feel strongly that a philanthropic advisor is an important addition to our personal boards of directors. As a philanthropic advisor, Allison works with her clients as a connector, a planner, and a guide for their charitable activities. Allison brings 20 plus experience to the table in this important aspect of the nonprofit sector. She has worked with many institutions, including Children's Mercy Hospital, the Children's Place, Kansas City Ballet and Theater, and the Women's Foundation. Her success on behalf of these organizations, their funders, and their beneficiaries was a natural path to her launching Patterson Philanthropic Advisors. Her expertise is a win-win as she helps generous individuals and their families navigate the sometimes complicated aspects of charitable giving. Today, she's here with us to walk us through how to create an intentional philanthropic plan that will help us simplify our giving and our volunteering. It will also help us take control of our giving and confidently say yes, and at times it'll make it easier to say no. I've known Allison for very many years and know that her passion and expertise is a valuable combination. Thank you for being with us today, Allison, and I'll now pass it to you. Thank you so much, Robin, and thank you Sternick Capital Management and your clients for being here today. Um, as Robin illuminated, I have been passionate about philanthropy since probably as early as I can remember. Um, and I've had a 20 plus year career here in Kansas City and in what I appreciated most about my time and working with donors as a development officer was the ability to get to know them, to understand their values, to understand the why behind they were giving to whatever institution that I was working with. And I also really enjoyed the fact that um, every one of us is a philanthropist. You don't have to be giving lots and lots of dollars and um, to be able to have an important impact on the organizations that you are are supporting um, and you know Robin in fact you know the kinds of donors like you who could come into a conversation with me and and and, ha and be able to say confidently yes I I know where my charitable giving is going and this organization really isn't fitting right now, but I'm so glad that you're doing this work. Um, and you know, because Kansas City is a small place and all over these days, it's a small place, you know, that happens a lot. And so I launched Patterson Advisors to help empower those donors that I had been working with for so very long to create an intentional giving plan that had real true impact no matter what their wealth level was. Um, so before we get started, I want to make sure 
that you know that there is a question and answer box. Um, so please feel free to type your questions in and at the end of the presentation, Austin will help us um, disseminate some of those, disseminate those, some of those answers, questions and answers. So first, this is a picture of Mackenzie Scott. And according to Bloomberg, she's worth $60.9 billion and is the 18th richest person in the world. Last year, Ms. Scott turned the philanthropic world on its ear by giving away over $4 billion to 384 organizations in a record setting period of time. So why am I showing you her picture? Because we all don't have $4 billion to give and we all don't have a team like Scott's, we can all use the same five step strategy that she used to create a, an intentional and straightforward structure for her giving. <laughs> and you can imagine now that she's given away all this money and been so transparent about it, um, she's giving, she's getting lots of requests. <laughs> um, and, but because she took the time and created her strategy, she and her staff are clear in what they can say yes to and what they can say no to. I believe that you should have received um, a PDF workbook prior to this webinar. And if you haven't, please be sure and let us know. We'll get it to you. And we'd, so that you could follow along and ask. And what I'm going to walk you through is how to utilize this packet for yourself. The workbook that I have created is based on the Philanthropy Toolkit, which was developed by the Stanford Center on Philanthropy and Civil Society. And I rely heavily on their resources and methodology, as you'll see throughout. Um, the good news is, is that since I'm in collaboration with Stanford and their toolkit, and we, re we refer to it as kind of a cookbook. And so what that means is that while it has lots and lots of resources and recipes, if you will, um, you don't have to use all of them. And I would also encourage you to take that with also the workbook that you've been given. You don't have to take all of the resources in that cookbook that I'm giving you, but take what you need. Um, and if you're interested in receiving one of this toolkits to learn more and even dive deeper into your philanthropy, I would love to provide you with one. So please let Austin or anyone here at Sternick know and we'll be happy to get one for you. First, I'd like to introduce you to some families like yours. Um, in this way, you'll be able to see how you can utilize pieces and parts of this plan um, for ways that might look something like, your, like you. Um, first, I'll introduce you to Harold. He is in his early 60s and he's just beginning to think about when he might retire. He does not have any immediate family or heirs and has really been focused on his career. So he doesn't really feel connected to a meaningful, in a meaningful way to any national or local organizations. In the middle, we have Rebecca and Paul. Rebecca and Paul are already retired and have two grown children and several grandchildren. They have been very diligently and strong supporters in their community of their faith community, local arts organizations. They are not only looking to navigate their retirement, they are also looking to navigate the rather substantial legacy that they're going to be leaving to their children and also build some family bonds. Then you'll notice Robin and Betsy, they are siblings. One is an anesthesiologist and the other is an attorney. They've both been successful in their lives, but they are really trying to do something for their parents and help them live a little bit more comfortably. Their parents um, came from modest means um, and worked hard to put their children through um, a good education. And, but truthfully, when you ask the sisters, charitable giving really wasn't a part of how they thought they might be able to accomplish their goal. 
So in my old role, we used to have a saying, people give because they're asked, they respond. What we know for sure is that a majority of American households are giving to charity in some fashion, food banks, religious organizations, disease prevention, and the list goes on. But whether you're in a position to give a dollar or a million dollars, every giver wants to understand that their gift has been meaningful to the organization. And they wanna ask themselves the same question. How do I channel the resources that I have and volunteering that I can do effectively to make the greatest difference for the organizations that I'm choosing to support and meet my own financial goals? But the thing is like any strategy or plan, you really need to invest a little time and maybe some resources um, in developing your plan. But once you have that plan in place, you can feel confident and empowered. So what you see here is, you know, whether you're already giving back or ready to get started, these are the five basic steps are really the foundation of any plan. And then you'll see at the bottom if you need a little help. The five steps are your why, your what, your who, your how, and your goal. First, we start with our why. So often, we want to begin with how. This is how we do it. I need to talk to my financial advisor. I'm just going to write a check and not really the why behind the how. A lot of times that's out of habit. Sometimes it's just because we're busy and sometimes it's just because we don't understand how philanthropy can be a powerful tool in our financial toolbox. Every single why is unique. Some people come to philanthropy with a very clear understanding of their why. They know the issues they want to support and where and how they want their giving to be directed. Your why may be, I can do a better job distributing my wealth and legacy than anyone else, and that's fine. Or I want to utilize the tools I have available to me to have what I need in my retirement and have some left um, to give my children or loved ones. Maybe you do want to leave a meaningful legacy that lives beyond you. Or maybe you're just curious and want to dip your toe in the water. The first step, start with your why, helps you to succinctly articulate that why by connecting it to your motivations and values. So the first exercise that you see in your PDF workbook is one that my colleagues at Stanford have called the two drink exercise. So that could be two glasses of wine or two glasses of lemonade, iced tea, whatever you choose but it's a series of question and decks of cards that you and, and whoever you're doing this with can use to begin to get in touch with or just redefine the why behind your plan. As humans, we inherit so much more than money. We inherit a family story. We inherit money messages. We inherit motivational values. The first part of the exercise asks you to think about and write down the moments in your life that have shaped you. People in your life who you admire and care about, loved one or a friend who might have battled an illness, maybe teachers at a school or, or coaches, your faith community. Think about your history, your legacy. Recall those stories, events and messages. Maybe you're from a small town or a busy urban area and because each story is unique, it lays the groundwork for your plan and it also creates a moment as you're working on this with whoever you're working on it, be it your spouse, your children, or even just yourself to recall those stories. Next in your packet, we dive a little deeper and we think about the values that define you. That define you. So in your workbook, there's several sheets. One is in list fashion and one is created so that you could cut it out and make a deck of cards. Both are just words, lists of words that might resonate with you like these. Community, family, 
service, respect. What we ask you to do within this exercise is circle as many as speak to you and then begin to or choose them out of the deck and then begin to narrow them down to one, two, maybe three. Um, it's actually kind of hard sometimes. <laughs> um, I found it difficult for myself. Then Stanford has created this wonderful Mad Lib-esque statement where you can plug in the words that you whittle down. And so it might sound like, so if your words were community, family, and respect, it might sound like if community, family, and respect were flourishing in the world or in my life, it would address many of the problems I care about. So you're probably going to move on to the, your second glass of wine or lemonade or whatever you're drinking at this point. And then we think, ask you to think about your issue areas. And again, what you see here is not a full list. Um, maybe you've given to some of these areas before. Maybe you have new priorities based on what's going on in the world. We're seeing that a lot in philanthropic giving. You see words like education, health social services, food and nutrition. In your packet, the way that it um, works is that you can put two of those pieces of paper together so that if you were looking at health, on the back side, it might have ways to dig into health because obviously health is a pretty broad issue. And also, you know, these are big topics. So there are spaces there that you can build your own and make it yours. But again, try and narrow it down to one, two or three that stand out. And this is how we then begin to create our focus statement, our why. Um, we put it all together in this grand finale Mad Lib. So we put our, our values in the first and the issues in the second. So it might sound like I am committed to community, family, and respect. I want to address health, education, and elderly services for my family and friends in our hometown. Or it could sound bigger. I believe in community, equity, and education, and I want to support education initiatives around the world for children who want to go to college. So when Harold went through this exercise, this is what his statement looked like. I believe in loyalty, patriotism, and health. I aim to support medical research, veterans services, and my alma mater for men like myself, both nationally and locally. And if you'll recall, Harold has no heirs, and he was just looking to dive into what philanthropy might look like for him. So when we dug into his why and we figured out his focus statements, his why, Harold had had his own cancer scare. His father had served in the military and he believed his success was due in large part to the football scholarship he received to go to a distinguished Ivy League school. He decided to begin funding national cancer research initiatives and a local organization providing services to vets with cancer and doing this anonymously. He then worked with his investment advisor to establish a scholarship fund in his name at his alma mater and began to consider what board membership might look like when he actually began to slow down from his career. Next, we move on to your who because we want to think through who we want to involve and how we want to involve them because let's be perfectly honest. Families, no matter how we define them, are complicated. But what we know is that utilizing charitable giving can help our families communicate and give our families um, more meaningful ways and build stronger connections and hand down legacy and history. But are we talking about children? Are we talking about grandchildren, spouses, partners, close friends? All of these are people that could be the family that we involved. 
What you do in step two in the section of your workbook encourages you to think about these questions and again, think through what your goal would be in engaging them. How are we talking about these sticky money issues within our families? How do we feel about the next generation playing a role? Are we worried about the amount of wealth that we're leaving to our children? Um, is that going to just wreak havoc on their lives? So if we go back to Rebecca, the example of Rebecca and Paul, what they really did was formalize their focus statement because they already have a very strong tradition of giving in their family. They focus on the arts, their faith community and education, but they were looking to build deeper relationships with their children and grandchildren. And they were also looking to navigate the wealth that they would be leaving their children and grandchildren. What they decided to do was to create a donor advised fund and then engage their, their children and grandchildren. Now they hold annual meetings at their beach house in the summer to choose the charities that they support. They kick off the meeting by Rebecca and Paul talking about the organizations that they have volunteered with in the past or supported financially in the past and the lessons that they've learned in giving those. Then the children and grandchildren propose organizations they would like to support based on the focus that Rebecca and Paul have created. Additionally, the way that Rebecca and Paul set up their structure was that they budgeted 20% of the available dollars each year for their children to direct to whatever areas inspired them. This way, their children who are busy raising families and creating their own wealth and legacy could be more generous than they maybe could otherwise. And it also gave, gives Rebecca and Paul insight into the things, the motivations and values of their children. Next, we move on to our what. We can finally sort of look at that piece because I can't think of a single person I know who likes to waste money. But if we aren't careful and take consideration to plan it, it can happen a lot quicker than we think. Right now might be a really great time for you to be looking at how you structure your philanthropic giving and contributions because you may have this information at hand or you may be simply looking at it as you're looking towards next year. What this slide shows is two worksheets that again are included in your packet. One to fill out about how you've given in the past and one that asks really good questions about how you would like to budget in the future. Um, and there are also pages about how you've given or volunteered in, in the past in how you'd like to in the future. Questions like, how would you like to contribute over the next year, over the next three years? What future um, financial situations or developments could um, affect how you allocate these dollars? Are there tax considerations on the horizon that you might want to be considering? Many of us just don't consider that if we did things a little bit differently, we might save ourselves on our taxes and be able to leave ourselves a bigger legacy to our family. And this is why it is so very important to get your team involved. And um, because the budget question should be considered within the context of your broader financial planning. On this slide, you see several of the folks that you might consider, your financial advisor, your accountant, your CPA, your estate attorney, your philanthropic advisor, and I realized that I omitted your insurance provider who could be a wealth of information. So Austin, what I'd love to hear from you or if you could tell us about some strategies that you've deployed um, or have used in the past or might suggest to your clients for them to use. Great, thanks Allison. So as a financial advisor, we want to assist on the what to give and how to give step, because while you can simply give cash, it is often 
not the most efficient or impactful way to give. So I want to highlight a few of the common giving strategies that we help implement. Firstly is bunching and growing donations with the donor advised funds. So in years of high income or realizing a large gain, you can bunch years of gifts to take advantage of a higher tax deduction by gifting to a donor advised fund. Then you can invest and grow those donations and then give them over time. Next uh, is donating a required minimum distribution via a qualified charitable distribution. So this is for a retiree at the RMD age that may not need the additional cash from their required distribution. They can gift some or all of that directly to charity um, and not have to realize the income tax uh, before giving, which will result in a, in a larger gift. And then lastly, let's take a look at an example of gifting appreciated securities. So in this example, stock was purchased for $30,000 and is now worth $100,000. So in this situation on the left hand side, um, the person sells stock and then donates the proceeds. So in this situation, you're going to have a capital gains tax on the $70,000 gain of about 17,000, which will then result in the contribution to the charity of about 83,000, which will then uh, lead to a, th about a $31,000 income tax savings. And then if we look at the situation on the right, uh, where we donate stock directly to charity, um, we can donate the full $100,000 value of the stock and have no taxes on the gain as we didn't sell the position. Um, and we'll also realize an income tax savings of about $37,000. So donating the stock directly to charity versus selling the stock and then donating those proceeds is going to result in a greater contribution and a greater tax deduction for you. So Allison, how about another example of this and maybe with an added strategy? Thank you, Austin. Um, yes, I love this example uh, that a colleague of mine, uh, a couple of that they worked with. This is Robin and Betsy, if you can remember, both successful in their careers and their goal was to do something meaningful for their parents and something that their parents would be comfortable with. Um, and, you know, they knew that they that they were very involved, that their parents were very involved in elderly services and health and education in their hometown, in their small hometown. So as they were talking with their investment advisor and because he understood and knew that they had this this why, this goal of, of working with their parents and being able to provide something with their parents, their, their advisor reminded the sisters that they're in the mid 90s, they had both invested in Apple stock and the value of that stock had appreciated enormously. So selling it would generate this huge tax burden. So working with their investment advisor, they set up actually a charitable gift annuity with that stock. Their parents were the recipients of the income during their lifetime of that annuity. And ultimately after their parents passing the annuity, um, will endow that organization that was really important to their parents in that small hometown. So the sisters gained their tax benefits. They were able to support their parents in a way that was comfortable for both the parents and their sisters because they actually weren't giving their parents any money, the organization was, and they've done so through a charitable vehicle while still planning for the welfare of their own families. So it's just a really great example of making sure to, to uh, to think about and, and talk to your advisor about some of those long term goals that you're thinking about. So within the context of our reflection, um, because we're, we're in this moment where we're reflecting, it's really important that we do our due diligence. Um, and in your packet and workbook, there are a host of questions that you can use to begin to dive deeper into the organizations you support and a list of resources to help you with that. 
because ultimately really what we want our giving and volunteering to come down to is trust. And we want to understand that that the dollars that we're giving are making a difference. They're making an impact. Do the organizations in their work that I support still line up with my focus statement? Or are there areas that I could actually streamline? Um, sometimes we find that. You'll find um, search engines like Char GuideStar and Charity Navigator that have thousands of, of national and local organizations. As we as we've mentioned before, Kansas City is blessed with a number of community foundations that have a wealth of knowledge and resources that you can use. And if you have a fund and even if you don't have a fund, I really encourage you to use their database. They have staff and conduct educational sessions all year long. Literally just last week, I sat in on a, a seminar that the Community Foundation gave about Gen X philanthropists, and it was really insightful. So for those not based in Kansas City, there, really, there are a lot of national resources that I've listed, some podcasts, and I do encourage you to take advantage of the resources in your local community foundations. You'll also see um, Stanford PACS on this, and it has a large directory of resources for you. Okay, we're almost across the finish line. Now we can start fresh with our new budget. We have a sense of what we've done in the past, where we want our focus to be in the future. We understand who we want to involve in all of this. And we've had a conversation with our financial advisor here at Sternet. We've talked to our CPA. We've maybe talked to our attorney or our insurance provider and determined the best way to utilize our financial resources. I like to advise people that I work with that as they sit down and map out their charitable budget, they think of the 80-20 rule where 80% of what they ha are giving or have been giving goes towards those organizations they've determined are in line with their values, their focus statement, the, the organizations they trust, those confident, intentional dollars. Then they can set aside 20% of those dollars to give in response to a national disaster, to a friend asking you to go to a luncheon or your neighbor asking you to sign up for that walk. Whatever your ratio ends up being or how you intend to approach the organizations you support, whether you're giving all of your resources to one organization or to lots of organization across the community, it's really just a, a suggestion to get you started. In our household, we have a donor advice fund. And in our donor advice fund is where our 80% lives. Our 20% lives in cash flow. And we've had a conversation and we've set aside an amount that either of us can say, sure, I'd love to sign up. And we really don't have to ask the other person because it's in our monthly budget, we're tracking it, and we kind of have a sense of how we're doing with regard to that. So also in your workbook, you'll see this amazing budgeting page that Stanford has created for you. It has space to record the organization you'd like to give to, the amount that you'd like to give the gift and when. And this is a great resource to take when you meet with your financial advisor or your CPA or your attorney. Um, it just really helps them know kind of what you're your desires are. And um, just this last month, I was working with someone who I knew planned to make an organization, uh, make their annual gift to an organization through their donor advice fund, which is wonderful. I happened to notice that that organization had tax credits available and that their annual donation met the minimum requirement. So I just pinged them and said, hey, let's make sure that you talk to your CPA um, and get them involved so that you can determine whether you want to make a different, make the gift in a different manner this year and also receive those um, tax credits for your um, taxes to use at a later date. 
So the final step is creating in your creating your charitable plan gets back to your charitable goal. Some people you'll hear a lot of people call this impact. And so often when we hear about impact in relation to charitable giving and how to be impactful, we talk about numbers and getting down into the weeds of the work of the organizations we, we give to. And, and this is where my background kind of kicks in because for that organization, tracking each gift, even if it's possible, really diverts the resources um, that are really truly needed to do the work of that organization. If you've done your homework, you've done your due diligence, you should have confidence in the organization and every dollar you contribute, you can confidently say will add that much more to that organization's outcomes. And let's be clear, charities are wonderful at telling us how our giving helps them achieve their mission. They can tell us how many people they served and lots of details about how they are making a difference in our community. But what I'd like you to, to encourage you to do is to think about giving in terms of your own goals. Can you answer three questions? Does your charitable giving or volunteering match your values and financial strategies, your focus statement, your why? Do you trust the leadership of the organizations you support? When you see the numbers and the data they give you, do you feel confident that they're being used wisely? And finally, who are the big givers in the areas you've chosen? What can you learn about their efforts and, and how they are assessing the progress? Remember Mackenzie Scott? She published her list of 384 organizations. Again, look at the Community Foundation, Jewish Community Foundation, Truman Heartland Community Foundation. What are they supporting in the community? Who are donors within the areas that you see who are leaders? And, and what are they supporting that you might just watch? Sometimes we all need a little bit of help though from someone who has expertise in the field. Um, sometimes we don't have time, we want in-depth information about a cause and we don't know where to find it, or we have a big change in finance about selling a company or receiving an inheritance that leaves us with a lot more or sometimes we just need help getting started. That's so for the same reason that you might work with your financial planner, your accountant or your estate attorney, you might work with a guide. Working with a philanthropic advisor like myself uh, can save you time, money and effort. I can help coordinate with your advisors and financial planning experts, um, refine or design your plan, support and facilitate family discussions, identify giving opportunities, and help you find other aligned funders and learning partners. With that, um, I'm gonna see if Austin, do we have any, any questions that have come through so far? Yes, so we have a few great questions here. Um, we'll start with the first one is I have several charities that I've supported for years and no individuals personally in the organization. They no longer align with my charitable focus. Do you know of any tactful ways to offboard a charity while maintaining relationships? That is a that is a wonderful question. Um, and honestly, I believe that uh, the best way that you can do that is be direct and talk to them about your new financial goals um, and charitable goals. Uh, I've seen lots of organizations and, and individuals as they've given talk to the organization about the fact that they would be stepping back their giving over the course of the next few years and really talking with the development officer about why that might be. But really my best advice would be to be open and direct with um, but to communicate it, absolutely. Great, and then another one here. You talked a little bit about engaging family. Do you have resources for talking to children or grandchildren? 
Yes, another great question. And actually, uh, in step two in the workbook, uh, getting started, I believe it's on page 14, there's a much larger section around family and engaging the next generation. It gives you questions, it gives you topics that you can begin to have those discussions around um, engaging your family. Uh, but again, sometimes those are sticky conversations that maybe we would like a little help or we'd like a third party sort of a neutral facilitator to take over the conversation with us so that they could either um, work through that issue for for the family or um, help just help guide you through the tough questions. So that's a great question. Good. And then what if I don't have a lot of money right now, but at least want to get learning? Any insights to get started? Yes. Um, so we are seeing lots of renewed energy around giving circles. And they are once again providing folks a great way to learn in a group setting without investing a lot of money. Um, I know here in Kansas City, uh, we have the Jewish Community Foundation has um, a giving circle. Uh, there is another giving circle, Impact KC, that is doing wonderful work. Uh, so, and then I gave some national resources because again, this is a, this is a, um, something that is, have a lot of energy that is coming back to it um, around the country. We see a lot of women um, who are giving through giving circles uh, as well, so. Great. Another one here, I heard you talk about a charitable gift annuity. That sounds complicated. Is there more information in the workbook or any other insight? Yes, so um, yes, there is. There are several pages that help um, break down, you know, just the definitions of what those kinds of things may be. Uh, but again, I really would encourage you if that sounds like something that you might be interested in or Ooh, wow, that's I, I'd never heard of something like that before. Please reach out to your team, your financial advisor, your um, attorney, your state attorney. Any of those folks can really help you dive deep into how that might work for you in as you as you move forward. Perfect. And then I'll just combine a couple of questions here. They're pretty similar. So I've never heard of a philanthropic advisor. How does that person work with me? Or why would I work with someone like you rather than someone at one of the community foundations? Thank you for asking that question. Um, you know, it's interesting. Uh, we are just now really sort of knowing and seeing um, more philanthropic advisors uh, come up. We we obviously have a couple at the community, at the different community foundations, um, but as an independent firm, I offer concierge services to my clients. And in addition to the special knowledge and expertise in Kansas City, I work with other regional and national philanthropic advisory firms. So there are lots of um, firms. They tend to work, however, with very high net worth um, clients. And so, you know, it it helps to work with someone um, on a on a very one-on-one um, -on -one basis to have a very high touch experience. That's one of the things that I most appreciated about working with my donors. And so that's one of the things that I bring to my clients. It's just a real an opportunity, no matter what your wealth level might be, to um, work in a in a in a way that it is very high touch. I am a fee fee only, so um, there's not a lot of um, um, it's just a fee fee based service. Um, and um, you know, sometimes people say, oh, I just need you to come in and, and help us with this particular project. Or they say, I would like for you to take over 
this aspect of my philanthropic giving and I just I just want to hand it over to you. So it kind of depends on the person and, and what they're looking for. So um, we try and tailor those packages to make that fit for that client. Great, and that looks to be all the questions we have today. Great. So before I go, what I'd love for you to consider is what if you've been given that $100,000 that Austin talked about earlier um, just to, to give away as you see fit? Um, I'd really love for you to think about how you'd spend it. Um, would you give it in one big gift or would you give it in many? Um, maybe you need to add a couple of zeros onto the back of that number. Will you give organizations you already know or did you find a new one? Um, did any of the tools that you've received today help you utilize this money further and help you achieve your own financial and charitable goals? And if you're interested, I would be happy to have a 30 minute Zoom session with you um, to talk about the plan that you've created for yourself or to talk about this $100,000 and, and what that looked like, if that's more comfortable for you. And I'll just give you tips and pointers and talk to you about how you get stuck. And if you're interested, please contact the folks here at Sternick um, and they'll be, or you can contact me directly, of course. Um, but what I really hope that you've gained today is that you'll get started really creating your own intentional, straightforward, engaging, fulfilling, charitable plan. Um, thank you so very much again, Robin, Austin, everyone here at Sternick. Um, I can't thank you enough for having me here. Thank you, Allison, and thank you to everyone joining us today. Have a great rest of your day.